It took Sam and Moe until noon to reach their destination, the woods behind the John Burroughs Lodge. Sam put his gear down in a dense grove of young hemlocks. Stay, he said to Moe. I'm going to climb that big tree and see what's going on. Park Service Rangers at the John Burroughs Woodchuck Lodge? Hmm, some story. Moe did not stay. He knew perfectly well what the word meant, but he also knew where he was. While Sam climbed the tree, Mole took his favorite fern trail to the lodge. He slipped under it, sniffing. Wood rats and a skunk had almost immediately taken over his old bedroom. He set upon the wood rat burrow, digging downward, sending the earth flying. The rat family exited by another tunnel. He rested a moment. The skunk must be handled differently. The den entrance was right beside his own bed at the base of the chimney. He lay down and woofed into it. His presence should send the skunk or skunks out their back door. Suddenly, he stopped. Men were talking in the room above him. Their voices vibrated the old wooden floor. His terror of people returned. Mole put his tail between his legs and slunk out from under the lodge into the bushes. He returned to Sam's pack in the hemlock grove and lay down. Sam jumped down from the bottom bough of the tree and hurried back to Mole. Good boy, he said, taking the dog's head in his hands and kissing the bridge of his muzzle. You didn't run off. Sam rubbed Mole's big ears, then his own. Listen to this, Mole, he said. There are two men here. I saw them through the window. I was too high to see their faces, only their feet. Also, there's a rabbit hutch by the tool shed. He crouched down. Falconers raise them for falcon food. And down by the country road is a huge rhododendron thicket. I think I saw a green vehicle parked in the middle of it. Let's take a look. Come quietly, Mole. The dog rose and followed. Sam took a circuitous route through the woods to the country road. He walked south on it, then turned on the dirt lane that led to the lodge. The rhododendron thicket was about 20 feet back from the burrow's lane and about a quarter of an acre big. Sam pushed back branches and looked around. There sat the green pickup with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service emblem taped to its door. Park Service rangers don't hide their pickups, he said to Mole, and walked noiselessly around the thicket until he found where the bushes had been cut down to let the green pickup enter. He walked to the Chevy. In it were three animal carrying cases. These cases don't tell me much, Sam said to the dog. They could carry rabbits or falcons or cats or even you, Mole. Mole began sniffing. Sam memorized the New York license plate, then walked to the cab and looked in. Oh boy, he said, whitewash, bird excrement. Falcons could be pigeons. He looked further. A half-empty box of bullets? I don't like that, Mole. Mole began to snuffle, sucking gobs of air over the hundreds of scent glands in his nose. Then he wagged his tail at a gray pellet on the ground. Sam looked down. By golly, he said, and picked up a casting from a bird of prey. He examined it carefully. It was almost fur. Rabbit, he said. The rabbits I saw are for food and they are being fed to a falcon, an owl, a hawk, or maybe a raven. He noticed the roundness of the pellet. I say ias, peregrine ias. Sam put the pellet in his pocket and walked back to the hemlock grove the way he had come. Seating himself on the ground behind the biggest tree, he cut a, pre a piece of venison jerky and gave half to Mole. Chewing on the other half, he stretched out on his back and wondered what to do next. He had to get the birds without the men seeing him. They were armed. Mole looked down beside him, the skunk on his mind. Look, looks like we found bait and scree, Sam said, and it looks like we found the Iases. Sam rolled over on his belly. Mole put his head on Sam's shoulder. You've got to be careful, old friend. I've got a plan, Sam said, more to himself than to Mole. Frightful's little falcons are in the lodge. I'll get one of the rabbits and let it go in front of the lodge. Then he addressed Mole. You'll chase the rabbit and yip so loud that the men come out to see what's going on. Then I'll go in the back door and get the ices. I'll be up the mountain by the time B and his friend can get up there. I'll be up the mountain by the time B and his friend can get their rabbit back. You'll have to follow my trail and catch up with me. Got it? Sam looked into the hound's sad, droopy eyes. I'm not sure you do, but I do know you'll chase anything that runs or flies. He patted Mole's head. Okay, this is it, he said and headed for the rabbit hutch. He never got there. Mole caught a whiff of the skunk and in seconds was under the lodge. He bore down on the skunk at the entrance to his den. Seeing Mole, the skunk calmly waited, then looked at him, waiting 
then looked at him, aimed his rear end, and let loose a jet stream of musk. It burned the mole's nose and eyes. He yipped in pain and ran around the lodge. The scent instantly seeped up through the old floorboards. It penetrated the kitchen in a yellow mist. Phew! Sam recognized Bates' voice. Skunk! A dog got hit by a skunk. His eyes burned and smarted. He could not see. Knocking over chairs, he and his friend ran to the front porch. Smart mole, said Sam, and dashed through the kitchen door. I stink! Bait bellowed from the front porch. Sam clutched the eyes box. Bait roared on. I'm going for a can of tomato juice to wash in. Sam didn't expect that. Bait was stumbling toward the kitchen. Sam was trapped. He put down the ices. A big box for firewood stood near him, so he opened the lid. The box he had hoped was empty. Into it he went one second late. Bait was in the kitchen. Sam crossed his fingers in the darkness, hoping Bait's eyes were burning too much to have seen him. He sat perfectly still. You're under arrest, Sam heard a new voice say. You are stealing falcons. Sam lifted the lid high enough to see not one, but two police officers in the doorway. They were facing Bait. Where's Scree? One of the officers asked. I didn't steal those birds, Bay said. The guy you're looking for is in that box. I came in to look around the famous lodge. I found him there with two falcons. He rubbed his smarting eyes. The officers rubbed their eyes, and Sam pushed up the lid of the wood box and stood up. Who are you? An officer asked in surprise. Sam Ridley? I live down by Delhi. I came here to get to these two chicks and bring them back to their mother. She's nesting near my house. That's a likely story, said the other officer. He lies, snarled Bate, backing toward his gun on the on the sink drain board. In the din of the accusations, a third man entered the kitchen. <sighs> Sam breathed a sigh of relief. There in his camouflage fatigues and hiking boots was Sean Conklin, the conservation officer of Albany County. He and Sam had tracked down Bate, who was posing as Leon Longbridge, had stolen Frightful from Sam. Sean Conklin would speak up for him. He would let him take the ISIS home to Frightful. Sam climbed out of the box, smiling from ear to ear. Out of the distance, Sam heard a car door slam. That's Scree, Sam said, the Arab agent. He's getting away in the pickup. Don't worry, Sam, Sean Conklin said. He won't get away. My assistant, Henry Ryan, Henry Ryan, removed the spark plugs from the truck. One of the police officers snapped handcuffs on Bait. Let me out of here, Bait snarled. I'm no thief. I'm a citizen. You're a, no thief, all right, Sam said. You are worse than that. You're a traitor, an environmental traitor. These little falcons belong to North America. I'm a citizen, Bait said, his face growing red with anger. Yes, you are, said the officer, but that doesn't give you the right to sell endangered species. Let's go see the judge. He steered him to the door. Bate looked back over his shoulder. I stink, he said. Can I even get some tomato juice? I don't smell you anymore, the police officer said. That's the best part of skunk spray. After a short while, you can't smell yourself or anyone else who's been doused in it. He chuckled. <laughs> but wait till I get home to my wife. Sam sniffed himself. He did indeed think he smelled clean. The police officer was right. He sniffed again, then picked up one of the little ices. Hello, he said to the bright-eyed bird, now showing the tips of his wing feathers. Want to go home to your mom? Bluebill looked at Sam and sat very still, eyes wide. He likes you. He sits still, even if you do smell, said Sean. I wish that were true, said Sam, stroking the downy head. But the truth is birds can't smell much. He's just scared. Henry Ryan came to the back door. Those two are on their, will to, on their way to jail again, he said, and grinned happily. This time, I hope the judge keeps them there. Sam picked up the ice box. I'll feed the little birds, he said. They're restless. They're getting hungry. Then I'll take them home. I, I'm afraid you can't do that, said Ryan. Why not? Sam said, astonished. You're not a licensed falconer. But these are wild birds. Not now. They've been registered in Albany. These two little birds are quite famous and are under the protection of the United States government. Well, who's going to raise them? Sam asked. They'll never fly free if people raise them. A falcon in Del Delhi is going to raise them. Perry Knowlton, he'll hack them back to the wild. They can learn to be free. Sam shook his head. He had never heard of Perry Knowlton. 
He leaned over the box and whispered in Falcon talk to the birds. You really should give them to me, he said. And why should I do that? Henry asked. I have their mother, Sam said. She nests in a box at my home on the mountaintop, and she's free. Are you kidding? Henry asked. Tell me, Sam told Sean Conklin and Henry Ryan the story of Frightful and the Delhi Bridge. You say the third chick's in a nest box on your property and its parents are taking care of it? Harry asked in disbelief. Yes, Sam answered. Frightful will take the little Isis right back. And that's the best thing for everyone. It is, said Henry, but we can't do that. Too much red tape. The Isis would be grandparents by the time we got through all the bureaucratic loops. With every day that passes, they're more deeply imprinted on people, Sam said. They need their own kind. I, I know that, said Henry, but we can't turn them over to you. Mole came into the kitchen. His eyes were still smarting from the direct skunk hit. He sought comfort from Sam. Get that dog out of here, said Sean Conklin. He smells terrible. I don't smell him, said Ryan. I'm going out to the porch, said Sean, and departed. Ryan followed. Blue Bill gave a hunger cry. Sam found fal falcon food in the old refrigerator, picked up the ice box, and went out to the, po the porch. Mole wagged his tail and trotted after him. Stay, Sam said. I mean, stay right here. I'm going to try once more to get the little ices. I have one more trick up my sleeve. Mole hung his head, put his tail between his legs, and sat down. On the porch, Sam and Henry each fed a little falcon, then rocked back on their heels and looked at them. Suppose, Sam said slowly and deliberately, you two had to go to town, and when you got back, the ices had disappeared. I'd be fired, Henry answered promptly, and I've got two kids. You know we can't do that, Sam, Sean Conklin said. Okay, Sam agreed, but I really don't understand. Everyone wants to save the peregrines, but no one wants to do what it takes to save them, from stopping work on the bridge to returning chicks to their parents. He leaned over to the Iases, who were now back in their box, full and sleepy. Psst, he squeaked through tight lips. Psst. The downy birds lifted their heads and turned their huge black eyes upon him. Cree, 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 he cried imitating Frightful. The Isis screamed the mother recognition call. Sam touched them gently on the beaks. Then he stood up. Sean and Henry stared at each other. They had just seen a boy who could talk to a peregrine, could talk to peregrine Isis. They knew he was the one person in the world who should have little birds, and they knew there was no way they could arrange this. Sam backed down the steps, found his pack in the hemlock grove, and whistled for mole. Together, they crossed the field in the direction of the mountains. The two men saw them stride along. I think we should have gone to town, Henry said. We're not free to do anything but what we did, Sean answered, watching with no little longing the young man who walked to his own inner music.